So excited to introduce to you Lori uh, from the Barona Cultural Center and Museum. And Lori, please kick us off. Thank you. Thank you everybody for having me and um, attending today. Happy Earth Day. This um, presentation is a little bit different than the ones I normally give. Usually I um, jump into classrooms and talk uh, all about the Kumeyaay history from the beginning, from creation to present day, and about the three waves of newcomers that um, changed their culture. Um, and so if there's any teachers or students out there that want me to do that for you, I'm happy to. Don't hesitate to call or um, email me. Um, but today, in honor of Earth Day, I thought it would be a little bit more fun to play Heme, and that is um, the Kumeyaay version of bingo. So Heme actually means to go look for or to search. And so we think that that fits with bingo. You're looking or searching for um, the certain thing that the caller calls out. But because we're on this format, I thought I'd walk you through all of these things so that you can learn more about the relationship the Kumeyaay people have with the earth and then play at home. If you see these things, you can cross off your, your Hame card. And if you get a Hame or a bingo, right, five in a row, then you can bring this to Barona Museum and get a prize. I want you to come up here and visit. We're open Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and you bring me your winning Hame and we will have a prize for you. So let's get started. Let's talk about some of this. Um, Kumeyaay people have always, always had a close relationship to the earth. They had an expert knowledge of all of the resources in the four ecological zones in their territory. So their territory spans from the coast all the way into the desert. And within that territory, you have a valley, you have mountains. And we know for our calendar year, there's four seasons, right? So they would move through their environment, through their territory, through these four ecological zones seasonally. And they knew which zone had what resource and they knew to collect it and get what they needed. A lot of old textbooks and old information refer to the people as being hunters and gatherers. And that's just not completely um, true. Those are not the words we would use to describe them. Hunter-gatherer kind of implies that people are just randomly roaming around looking for food, uh, maybe an animal to hunt, random berries, nuts, seeds. And that just wasn't the case. The Kumeyaay people had a, a superb mastery of this land and they knew where things were and they would return to their same family um, fights year after year and get what they needed. It's so interesting to me because how did they know this, right? When we need something, we go to the store, we get to Walmart, we get to Target and they usually have everything we need. And we, we buy it, we don't have to go out and find it and we don't have to plan three seasons ahead to get what we need. So how did the Kumeyaay people know all of this? This information was given to them by their creator. The creator put them here on this land in the very beginning and gave them the information they needed to live here successfully forever and ever. And part of that, um, what they learned from the creator was that each plant and animal uh, had value, right? Back in the old days, the people and animals were the same. They could communicate. They really weren't any different. Um, and the plants were there as tools. So as time progressed, things changed. The people became mortal. Um, and then they looked to the plants and animals um, for more of a food source. And actually deer, and I'll get to him in a minute, he played an important role. So all of the things you see here on this Khmer sheet um, have an important role in Kumeyaay philosophy that was given to them by their creator. 
And there's so many more, right? I could only fit this many on the on the Hame sheet. So I hope that you'll come visit the museum or call me up and ask for an outreach so that I can share so much more with you. But let's start. Okay, so there's Hummingbird. His name in the language is Hal Fushut. So you can try saying that. Their language was never written down. It never had an alphabet attached to it. It was all oral. Um, but later, there's a linguist that decided we better learn how to write this down so that we can keep it alive, keep it and maybe have a dictionary. So when you see two vowels together, that's not something we do in English, but that just means that's a longer sound. So that's hal pushut, and that's hummingbird. So hummingbird especially, you see that bright red neck he has, he was responsible for starting the fire with that bright red neck on the, on the funeral pyre. So shamans were very, um, shamans valued hummingbird because he had special powers just like the, the shaman. So they were very, very special birds. Willow. Willow is a very special plant because you could do so many things with it. It could be a type of medicine. So back in the old days, the people knew that if they had a headache or some kind of body ache, maybe they were sore, um, they would drink a tea made out of willow and it helped them feel better. It relieved their pain. And it was only, you know, a couple hundred years ago, actually, that Western science caught up with that. And they, they looked at willow and they studied it and they found a chemical in the willow called salicin. And that's how they developed aspirin. So, you know, the Kumeyaay people didn't have a name for it, like salicin, and they didn't develop aspirin, but they knew that if they made a tea from willow, and drank it, they felt better. So I want you guys to think about too, is native knowledge just as good as our Western knowledge? It can be, it is, it worked. Uh, in this case with willow. So it's very important not to um, judge um, someone's knowledge if it's a little bit different than yours because it could be equal, it's just a different way of knowing. So here with Willow, they made um, pain relieving um, tea. It could be used, the branches could be used to make baskets, uh, granary baskets to keep their acorns safe because pests don't like Willow and so it keeps the bugs out. And it could also, the branches could be also used to make their, um, their sleeping structures. So those are called awa. Uh, it's a little dome shaped, um, some people call them huts, uh, and some people also refer to them as being houses, but, you know, they didn't really live in a house. They lived outside. They only used their awa for sleeping at night and putting their stuff inside, right, keeping their stuff inside. The next thing, um, flower, watapsh. The flowers are very important because, um, like I said, they had all the knowledge about each plant, each uh, each of the resources in their environment. And flowers and plants are really important medicine. And so each flower, each plant um, was helpful. Not to mention some could be turned into baskets and be useful as other tools. The sun. The sun was placed in the sky by their creator. And it's the one truth that the Kumeyaay people rely on, right? They didn't have uh, Western science that explained how the sun goes around the earth, but they knew that it would come up every day and they were able to track time. They understood um, um, the cycle of the sun, even though Western science, scientists didn't tell them about it, um, but they relied on the sun coming up every day. They knew it would happen. And it's a reminder of the power of the creator that could put something in the sky like that. And then there's crow, achtai. If you've ever watched a crow, um, you'll see that they're pretty smart. You know, there's a lot of them around and they're always in the trash. And, you know, a lot of people think of them as pests or they're nuisances today, but they're really smart. And if you take the time to watch them, you'll see that they're very um, 
very intelligent and they do things that other birds don't. They pay attention. They can often be trained. Some people have pet crows. Um, but when we see crow, it reminds us of, uh, well, there's a story. It reminds us of how coyote tries to deceive us. So coyote's a bad guy. He lies. He doesn't tell the truth. He's always lurking in the shadows, waiting for an opportunity. Um, you always have to be aware of coyote. And he tried to pull a trick on two crow sisters. And the, the crows were smart enough and intelligent enough that, that that didn't happen. So when we see crow, it reminds us to be careful and believe in people's actions and not just the words they say, right? It's what people are actually gonna do. It's how they behave, not just what they say they're gonna do. So crow reminds us to be smart like they are. The deer, the quack. Uh, he, when, when people became mortal um, and they realized that they needed food to eat and they were kind of looking around going, now what, what are we going to do? Deer was the first one to stand up and say, you can eat me. And the people were so grateful for that, to have deer's food, that um, every time they go out hunting, uh, you know, they say a little prayer and of thanks, and they don't waste any part of the deer. They eat the meat, they keep the hide, it can be repurposed, it's a nice blanket or a mat to sleep on. Um, the bones could be used, could be shaped into bone needles or things called awls, A-W-L-S. And um, they just didn't waste any, any deer and they certainly didn't kill it if they didn't need it, right? It wasn't for sport, it was for survival. A hut. That's dog. And so really a hut means pet. And back in the old days, the Kumeyaay people could have an a hut that was a horse or a cow. Um, nowadays it's dogs and cats, right? But that just refers to a pet. Kumeyaay people have pets. And then a kui. A kui are clouds. And if you've ever heard of the place called Kuyamaka, that means behind the clouds. So a kui is cloud. A, mac, a muck is behind, and when you put it together and, um, you know, other non-native people try to say it, it comes out Cuyamaca, so like Cuyamaca College and all that, but really a cui is cloud, and so um, that's just a little bit more. Um, Hexiao, cottontail rabbit, we see them all over. Um, they're plentiful, and it's food, right? They're a little bit small. They're not like the big giant jackrabbits that would have given them more meat, but Hexiao is there. And if you look at the moon next to it, you see how similar those words are. So cottontail is Hexiao and the moon is Hexia. Those two are so similar because most non-Western uh, groups see a rabbit in the moon. So we, I was always brought up, you look up to the moon and you see a man on the moon, you see the, the face in the moon. But Kumeyaay people look up and they see a, a rabbit, a little cottontail. And so that's why the words are so similar, Hexia and Hexia. And if you look at that moon, imagine that Hexia, the cottontail, turned to the right. And he's almost like upside down with his tail and his ears on the bottom. So his ears would be on the right hand side. So they see Hexiao in the Hexia. And the moon was also placed by the creator so that there would be some light to see by at night. They didn't want total darkness. So the light is a, a, also a reminder of the power of the creators. So raccoon is Nimas and he was a food source, right? So that's something we kind of think of today and go, ew, I don't know, I don't, don't want to eat a raccoon. But remember, their creator gave them all these resources. So if raccoon was there and he um, was able to be caught, you know, that was food. That's what kept the people going. And guess what? Same with skunk, cash wheel. Skunk, I wouldn't eat him, right? But he was food if it needed to be. And he was all 
even though he's stinky, he has a place. All of these plants and animals have a have a place in Kumeyaay philosophy. They have a role, and they were valued for that role. Star, quick yup. So the people knew about astronomy, right? They didn't study it. They didn't study the Greek um, constellations or anything. They had their own constellations and they looked up to the heavens and they knew when time was changing, they could see, they could chart different constellations and knew when seasons were changing, when the equinoxes were, when the solstices were. They knew all these things. They were timekeepers. And again, this is part of their philosophy. And so, well, it's not on the earth itself. And today we're celebrating Earth Day. It's part of part of our world. And so um, Kweshiap is, is important. Point Loma, Makunish. The people lived there. That was in their territory. Um, and when you look, when you're say at Barona and you're coming down the hill and on a clear day, you can look out and see Point Loma. But from this vantage point, it looks dark. It's all black, right? Because it's so far away and um, the sun is just in the position that it is. And so it just looks like this big piece of black land jutting out into the ocean. And that's what Matkunish means. It means land, the one that's black. Okay, so that's uh, Point Loma. Chi is fish. Probably not a goldfish. They didn't have goldfish, but um, any fish they could refer to as chi. A lot of fish had their own names if they wanted to be specific, uh, but you could just use chi as fish. Black oak tree. Now there are so many kinds of oaks, um, but the black oak is the one that they preferred because it gave the biggest, fattest acorns, right? So they'd be up in the mountains in October uh, when the acorns were falling off the trees and they would collect them and um, save them and have acorn all year long, it was a, a staple food source for them. So they, if they were gonna go to all the effort to collect all those acorns, they wanted the biggest and the fattest ones. So kupash is the black oak tree, very important. Matkulahu, that's La Jolla. I think everybody knows about La Jolla. Uh, a lot of people think that that's a Spanish word about jewel or something like that, but it's not, that's a, that's a, a Western change on the Kumeyaay word of Matkulahu, which means land of caves. I'm sure you guys have all been to La Jolla and seen the caves, land of holes, land of caves. That's what that means. So La Jolla is really um, kind of a changed Kumeyaay word and they certainly live there. There's a good book you guys should try to read called Saltwater Boy. And it talks about um, living there at the coast way back when. And if you think about living at the coast and all the resources there, um, you know, tons of fish, tons of sea life, shellfish, um, they would gather uh, asphaltum, you know, there's sycamore trees close by, just what a lovely place to live seasonally, right? Uh, the next thing is shai, buzzard. A lot of people are like, ew, you know, they're known for cleaning up the carcasses on the side of the road. You know, they're scavengers, they're gross, and they smell, and that's all true. But what is their purpose? It's to help keep the earth clean, right? So they're, they're disposing of um, dead animals for us. We don't have to do it, they do it. Um, but also, Sha'i plays a role in their um, early stories, um, back when, you know, animals and people were the same and, com and could communicate. Um, there were two twin boys and they played their flute and two buzzard girls came um, to marry them. So, um, you know, each, each animal has a role. Hamasha. So it's just a slightly different um, way it's spelled there in the Kumeyaay language than how we have it in our, our English today. So Hamasha, we know it as a place. It's a place in San Diego, but really Hamasha is a gourd. It means gourd. And that was the place where this gourd plant, these, these wonderful gourds were grown that they could make their rattles out of. And so these soap, soap gourds um, 
or for ceremonial singing, right? So it was important the men did the singing and the women would accompany them with dancing. And that's how they told their stories and kept their philosophy alive. And how they how they had their ceremonies, their funerals, their weddings, their puberty ceremonies, all of those things required a gourd. And they would get them there at that place. And that's why it's called Hamashah. It's named for the gourd. Kulashash, blue jay. So there's lots of, a um, lot of Native American stories about Blue Jay talking about his fancy feathers, you know, maybe he flew up to the rainbow to get blue and bring it down. Um, but really, for Kumeyaay people, um, Blue Jays like to eat acorns. And so I think that they would watch the Blue Jays and know that it was time, because Blue Jay knows when the acorns are ripe and ready to go get, so they would, it would be a race to go get the acorns before the blue jays and the squirrels and all the other critters that like acorns. So if you keep an eye on blue jay, then it kind of gives you a, an idea of if it's time to get the acorns or not. And you have to remember that animals are teachers. Um, Mr. Quero from Campo has reminded me many times that animals are teachers and uh, we can learn from them. Palomar, uh, maybe some of you have been to Palomar Mountain, the big observatory there. So Palomar is just a funny way of saying the Kumeyaay word for that place, which is called Apal Umar, and that means winning arrow. So there was a battle there at one point, and they won. They had the winning arrow at that site, and so they've called it winning arrow ever since. And then later, English-speaking people who probably didn't quite understand what the people were saying called it Palomar, and that's what stuck. So Palomar is actually a Palomar, okay? Another place we're all familiar with is Mission Valley. They called that Nipawai, and that was their home site. They, they lived there, it's close to the beach, it's close to the lake, it's close to the river, it's close to the mountains. Uh, that was a wonderful place to be. And then after the newcomers arrived, you know, the mission was built there and they, they continued to live there. The Mexican Rancho period, they continued to live there under duress, but it was still the home that they knew. And then eventually so many people came to San Diego, the Indian people had to, you know, look for other places to live. So they don't live there anymore, but that Mission Valley is part of um, their original territory, their homeland. And maybe some of you know that every year the river floods, the people knew that. They knew about that and, um, you know, had the, the engineers and all the people that built that Mission Valley asked the Native Americans, they would have said, hey, build it because it, build it differently because it floods. We could tell you that. The next place is actually uh, Poway, and it's really Powi in the Kumeyaay language. So again, like um, La Jolla and Palomar, right? It's a Kumeyaay word that's been changed by our English speaking um, abilities. So it's Pawi. And that's the name for a special kind of rock that you can only find there. And that rock was excellent at turning into arrow points. So they knew that that was the place to go get Pawi to make great arrow points. And now we call it Poway. And then finally, a hawk, Meswir. Um, Meswir was the helper, one of the helper birds for the great shaman, Kuchama. And when Kuchama died, his helper birds continued to soar high above the earth and always look down. Uh, they're watching us, right? And they're, if we do something wrong, they're going to fly back to Kuchama and tell on us, right? He's, they're going to go report what they see. So there's the eagle, um, the hawk that watch us during the day. And if you ever see a, a, a hawk, he's flying in circles, looking down, looking down at you, watching you. And then the owl does the same at night. So owls watching us at night. So remember, these animals are, are watching us, they're teaching us, right? And it's a good, good message for us to, when we see a hawk, remind us, oh, we should be doing good. We should be doing something good now because we're being watched. Okay, um, I think I raced through that. And if you guys can print this out or screenshot it and you wanna mark it up and bring me your winning chamei, um, we have a prize for you.
I'm happy to take questions if you all can help me facilitate that. Okay, yes, I can definitely help out with that. I've been jotting down a few questions that I've seen that were really good. Um, the first one that I think we'll start with is, um, can you please remind us what year or century you're speaking about? That was a great question, just for a little bit of context for some of our students here. Okay, so the Kumeyaay people have been here since the beginning, right? It's been since time immemorial. They've been here so long, they don't even know when that was. Um, so most of these things, their philosophy, I'm talking about pre-contact before anybody else was here. And we know the first group that arrived here that started to make changes was the Spanish in 1769. So when I'm talking about pre-contact, it's before 1769. And a lot of these old philosophies come from the very beginning, early on when they were created by the creator. Great, thank you. Uh, another question that we had is, um, did they have pets for hunting, like dogs? Oh, a question about, or any animals to help them hunt? Um, I think everybody had, well, not everybody, but I think that there were dogs early on, um, and they might have gone hunting, but they certainly weren't like, um, you know, beagles or the, the dogs that have been bred specifically for being helpers. I think their pets were more companions. Okay, great. Uh, we also had another question asking, are these type of people still in San Diego? Excellent question. Yes, the Kumeyaay people are still here. Um, their culture has been changed. They don't live in their awas anymore, right? They live in modern day houses. The kids go to school, they play Minecraft and Roblox, and they like the they get their groceries from Albertsons just like we do. They wear the same kind of clothes that we do, right? They're, they're humans, they're people just like us. The only difference is that their families have been here since the beginning. I'm not native, my family has moved here. If you're not native, your family has somehow moved to San Diego and we call this home, it's our home. But the Kumeyaay people are still here and this is their home since the very beginning. So they are still here. So if you hear about reservations in San Diego, like Barona, Vieja, Sequan, Manzanita, La Costa, Mesa Grande, San Isabel, that's where most of the people are living now. The government set aside land for them so that they could have a place to live. Great, thank you. Uh, we've got a couple more coming in. Um, so uh, someone is asking, what did they use to hunt? Oh, okay. Um, so mostly bow and arrow. Um, they would have some um, spears, and certainly you can imagine living at La Jolla and going spear fishing right in the in the cove there. Um, and then they would have traps, different kinds of traps for small game. And the little kids actually um, could make their own rabbit sticks and go out and hunt small game as well. Well, that's great. I'm sure some of you maybe can imagine that in your minds, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, I got another, I, I like this question. How do you know so much about Kumeyaay people, Lori? Oh, I, <laughs> um, you know, I've worked at Barona um, almost 13 years, and I studied a lot, and I talked to the people a lot. And, you know, there's a, a Kumeyaay philosophy that you should learn three new things every day, that you never stop learning. No matter how old you are, you keep learning. So I still consider myself a student, and I'm still learning every day, and I, I try to learn at least three things about them every day. So it's just because I've been here a while, and I, and I keep reading, keep talking to people, keep learning. I don't know it all. That's great. Thank you. Uh, we've got another question here. Um, how did they cook their food? Good. Um, so it depends on what kind of food it is, right? If they had, they were living at the beach and they had salt and fish, they could dry the fish and um, save it for later. Same with the deer meat, you know, they could have deer jerky. They would eat fresh meat or they could um, preserve it and make jerky. Uh, their acorn mush, they would cook in a 
in a, they could cook in a basket or in a clay pot over the fire. Um, they could make soup and stew like that in a pot over the fire. They had all kinds of plants they could eat fresh or boiled. Uh, they could have berries and seeds and nuts. They had all kinds of things to eat, different ways to prepare them. Great, thank you for that. We've got a bunch of questions coming in, so I'm really gonna try to get to everybody. Um, I know that I keep seeing the question pop up about how to play the game. Can you just clarify that really quick for everybody? Sure. So if you have seen any of these things where you are, I'm, I'm hoping you all are in San Diego in Kumeyaay territory. These things still exist in Kumeyaay territory. So if you have seen these things where you are, you can cross off that square. So I'm looking out my window. I don't see the sun out. So maybe not today. You can't cross off the sun. But if you see a crow, cross them off. If you see the moon tonight, cross it off. If you see a bunny, cross it off. And when you get five in a row, you can bring it to the museum and get a prize for winning the May. Okay, great. Thank you so much for the explanation. There's a, a lot of people wondering about that. Um, so let's see. Let's take some more here. Um, we've had a couple of people ask about their creator. So I know Mr. Brown is giving a presentation later on that, his family's right. creation story. Um, and you can learn more at the museum. And if you want me to um, do an outreach for your class or your group, I'm happy to talk more about it. But um, to just briefly touch on it, there were two brother creators and they came up, there was nothing but ocean. And they came up out of the ocean and created land, created the sun and the moon, created plants and animals and people. Um, but I, I will let Mr. Brown tell the rest of that story. Okay, great. Thank you for introducing it a little bit. Um, another interesting one here we have, uh, what did they use to build their houses? So they had willow, the big fluffy willow branches. Um, or they could use tule, which is found along the river. It's kind of, it's a hollow, almost like bamboo type reed. And they could um, lash all those together over a dome structure. So like think of like a wooden bones to a dome and then all of the plant material lashed on so that it was uh, waterproof, weatherproof, and there was a little hole in the top for this for the fire smoke to come out, and a little little archway entryway to go in and out. Great, thank you. Um, we've got Zach from third grade wants to know: Are they vegetarians? Well, you know, today I think a lot of them could be. You know, just like anybody else, if you choose not to eat meat. I think that's a personal decision, um, but pre-contact, um, they needed a lot of protein, just like we all do. You know, if you're not eating meat, you have to find the right fruits and veggies to keep uh, your body healthy. And so um, I think back in the old days, probably most of them were meat eaters to get, get the nutrients that they needed. Great, thank you. Uh, we've also got, how would they make their clothes? That's a good question. Good question. So they didn't really wear clothing back in the old days before the Spanish got here. Um, women could make willow bark skirts. Women would make skirts. And if you think about it, women had to sit on the rocks and grind acorns and sit in the grass and make things, you know, so it might help to have a little skirt as a cushion or a protection. Um, when you're sitting doing your work. So women wore skirts and men actually wore a tool belt and they attached all of their tools to their belt. So, you know, they weren't shy and they didn't have, you know, any problems, um, you know, being naked or showing parts of their body that, you know, we do today. It's kind of different for us today. We wouldn't go without clothes. And that's the one thing when the Spanish arrived in 1769, one of the first things they did was teach the people how to cover their bodies and give them robes and, and uh, material to make clothes from. 
So before the Spanish arrived, um, you know, they would have rabbit skin blankets if they were cold or deer hide, you know, to wrap up in uh, for warmth. But San Diego is usually not so bad. You don't need clothes um, for warmth. So great. Thank you. Okay, we've got a couple minutes left. I'm going to try to get to some of these last ones that I'm seeing here. Um, I like this. How did they ever live in deserts? <laughs> so, yeah, so <laughs> not a lot of people want to go to the desert in the summer. And I think that the, the Kumia people were the same. You know, they found a, a different place to go. You know, in summer, it's kind of nice to go to the beach. It's a little bit cooler. Um, but, you know, it's still not horrible. There's a lot of desert folks that live by water. Um, there's mountains close by. They could go up to a higher uh, elevation. Um, and there's still resources there. I'm not saying it would be easy, but um, they could. They, they had the tools and the knowledge to do so. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, another neat question. Did they ever have free time? And if they did, what they what did they do with their free time? I love, that's such a great question. Yes, they had free time every evening. They'd get up, do all their work, their daily chores, just as everybody does. But they had free time when the sun went down to gather together as a, an extended family, tell their stories, um, teach the kids, you know, through their stories, their philosophy. They had time to sing and dance. They had their whole religious or um, philosophical belief system that they could um, reiterate every night around a fire. They could do their ceremonies. So they certainly had free time um, for all their other social society aspects. So they worked real hard during the day and at nights when they did all their other, um, you know, normal living. Great. Thank you. Um, let's take maybe... Kim, what do you say? Maybe one more? Yes, let's, okay. let's go with one more question and um, then we'll wrap it up. Okay, great. Um, this kind of builds off of the, maybe builds off of the free time, but um, when they made pictures on the walls, do they mean something? That's yeah. a great question too. Yeah, a lot of that rock art, pic, um, pictographs or petroglyphs, um, we don't, we don't know a lot about, um, so they're a little bit mysterious, but the ones we do know about definitely tell a story, and that's for a reason. So we know that um, after girls went through their um, becoming an adult ceremony, they would uh, make a mark on a rock, and we know that um, there's rock art that indicate, um, you know, solstice events. Um, it does mean something, but many of the, the interpretations have been lost to history. Okay, great, thank you. And I keep seeing, I know that you already explained this, but I keep seeing the question about how they can get this uh, card, the, the bingo card, can they print it out? Can you, yeah, if you can screenshot it here or... Um... And I'll look into, um... If you registered for this event, I think there's an option um, that I can send you an email after the event uh, with this Heme card attached. Um, but I'll also put my email address in the chat. So that way, any teachers, if you'd like uh, to email me, um, Lori, if you'd like uh, to put your email in the chat, you're welcome to. But um, teachers, you can feel free to email me and I can send it, the Hame card to you via email as well. And I'll do the same. So yeah, here's mine, it's coming. So that's, that's mine, lhedley at barona nsngovernor So if you need this or any other information, I'm happy to. If you have follow-up questions that we can't get to today, I'm more than happy to talk with all of you. And also, just as a reminder, you turn it in at Barona Museum, correct, Lori? Yes. Yeah, we're open Thursday, Friday, to, uh, noon to five, and Saturday, 10 to four. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lori, for joining us this morning. It was uh, just wonderful to learn more about Kumeyaay. 
um, history and um, language. And you certainly helped me uh, put more of a perspective on this place I call home, San Diego, learning words uh, like uh, Poway. How did you pronounce it again in Kumeyaay language? Poway. Poway. Um, I'm so excited to have even a broader context from the Kumeyaay perspective on um, life here in San Diego. So well, thank, thank you so much. I hope it was helpful and um, relevant to Earth Day. Happy Earth Day, everybody. Thank you so much for having me.